This morning's gospel comes from Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 11. And that can be found on page 82 of the New Testament portion of your Red Pew Bible. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He pro prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God, except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so like I said to the children with the hidden picture book, just like the children, the same is true for us. Our lives revolve around what we see or really how we see. One theologian says, you see what you are. We do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. And I find that idea really intriguing because I think it's true. I think about the times when I say, you know, I'm having a really bad day. Well, it may not be that I'm actually having a bad day, but maybe just one negative thing happened and now that's colored my whole day so that I can't see anything positive anymore. A Jewish rabbi writes this about seeing. Religion is not primarily a set of beliefs, a collection of prayers, or a series of rituals. Religion is first and foremost a way of seeing. It can't change the facts about the world we live in, but it can change the way we see those facts, and that in itself can often make a difference. So I'd like to look at these two Bible stories that you just heard and look at what the people in those stories see. So first is the story of Naaman, who was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. So he was pretty powerful, had a lot of influence, right? But he also had leprosy, which was huge in that time. So Naaman went to see the prophet Elisha, but he went in a parade of horses and chariots carrying silver and gold and all this treasure. Because Naaman assumed that once, once Elisha saw how powerful he was and how much treasure he was bringing with him, that Elisha would instantly cure him of his leprosy. But Elisha didn't even come out of his house. <laughs> he sent a servant to tell Naaman to go wash in the River Jordan seven times. Naaman, again, assumed that Elisha would come out, wave his arms around, chant a few prayers, and he would be cured. He shouldn't have to do anything. So he was angry, and he went away in a rage, because he knew what Elisha should do. But God and God's prophets don't always do what we think that they should, right? But luckily, Naaman, for Na luckily for Naaman, his servants convinced him to do what Elisha told him to do, and he went and washed, and he was cured. And then he sees. He returns to Elisha and says, Now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. He sees that it was God working through Elisha who cured him. And then there's the Samaritan in the story from the Gospel of Luke. He was one of ten people who had leprosy who approached Jesus begging for mercy from him. They were ostracized and outcasts, considered unclean and not able to be with the normal people. They were cut off from their families and their community, and they probably felt cut off from God or thought God was the cause of their leprosy. And then here's Jesus. And he says to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And they were made clean and cured on their way. 
to see the priests. The scripture points out that it's only the Samaritan who returns to Jesus, which is actually a big deal, because Samaritans were considered enemies of the Jews. But this Samaritan returns to Jesus because he saw who Jesus was. The Samaritan sees the connection between God and Jesus when the other nine did not. Perhaps they couldn't imagine God working through an ordinary man. And the Samaritan's response is one of gratitude and worship. Pastor Brian Stoffergen talks about gratitude and thankfulness as the proper response to Jesus' love for us. And I think for the most part that's true. But the key for me is being able to see it. Sometimes we don't see the way that Jesus showers us with love and grace. And often I think it's because we expect God to do certain things or behave in certain ways. We don't see God working in our lives and in the world because we're looking for the wrong thing. Like the nine who didn't return to Jesus, they were still cured of their leprosy, but they didn't see that it was Jesus who cured them. We don't always see Jesus, even though we know in our heads at least that God is always with us. But I also agree with Stoffergen when he says that there are times when we should not be thankful for the situation we're in. When someone we love has died suddenly and tragically, how can you be thankful? When you've just experienced the path of a hurricane like so many people have done this week, how can you be thankful? When you've just lost your job and you can't pay your mortgage, how can you be thankful? Those are the times when our response is not thankfulness, but our response is to reach out to each other for help and to reach out to God in prayer. Those are the times when maybe I can see where God is in your life when you can't. Or maybe we can both struggle with that together, but be thankful that we have each other to love and support us. Because sometimes we truly can't see God. Or we blame God for the situation we're in. I know I've certainly done that. I've blamed God for bad things that have happened and situations I've been in that have been pretty horrible. It's easy to do. It's certainly much easier to blame God than to be full of gratitude when you're struggling. But that's when we need each other. I know when my previous husband was so sick and he was in Pittsburgh and I was up here and I couldn't do anything, I was so angry with God. I was blaming God for everything. And they needed my friends to say, you know what, no, God didn't do this, this is not God's fault. But we don't always want to hear that in that moment. We want people to commiserate with us and say, yes, that's right, God is mean, and how could he have allowed this to happen? Sometimes we see what we want to see, or maybe what the world tells us we should see. But what we need in those times are people who see God and who are filled with God's joy and hope. Maybe neither of us can see God in that moment, but we keep trying and maybe in a week or a month or a year, we can see where God was in that moment. I've just started reading a book called The Book of Joy. It's a conversation between the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Desmond Tutu about joy. It's about how they've chosen joy over despair and anger and bitterness their whole lives. Because these are people who have been through a lot in their lives, a lot of tough times that could easily have led them to be bitter and full of anger and hopelessness. But they choose joy and hope. They said one of their goals is to explore how we can transform joy from a fleeting feeling into a lasting way of being. I think that's a pretty awesome goal. <laughs> so I want you to think right now, do you know someone who chooses joy and hope in their lives? Someone who lives it every day? Someone whose life is not perfect and has struggles of their own? but who is so full of joy and hope 
and love. Can you think of someone? I could think of several people, and I'm thinking some of them are here today, too, (laughs) gathered here. (laughs) But one of them is my mom. She definitely chose joy and hope in her life and lived it every day. Not that she didn't have tragedy and struggles in her life, she certainly did, but she chose joy and hope over grief and anger. And it was because of how she saw the world. She saw God everywhere. She saw God working in her and through her. She saw God in her congregation, in her community, in the world. She saw God everywhere. And because of that, she lived her joy and spread it everywhere she went. So what do we see? Do we see God actively working in our lives and in the lives of the people around us? Do we see the needs of those who are suffering and seek to help them? Do we return to God full of gratitude and worship? Again, it's about perspective, even in the midst of tragedy. We can't change the facts of the death of someone we love or losing our job or the pain of divorce or any of those things. But how we see can change our perspective of those things. So how do we see God when our spouse or parent or child is lying in a hospital bed? How do we see God when there's so much violence in the world? I think it's also about what we do when we are full of gratitude and joy. We are the hands and feet of God who love and care for those who are suffering. We support things like Lutheran disaster response for relief after a hurricane. We pray for and spend time with people when their loved one is sick or dying. We work here in our community to put an end to injustice and to walk with those who experience it. We're the ones who can help others see God in their lives through our actions. We can help them change the way they see. We can help them see that God did not cause their tragedy or struggle and that joy and hope are possible. So back to my question. What do you see? Where do you see God in your life? Where do you see God in the lives of the people around you? And then what do you do when you see? I challenge all of us this week, myself included, to be aware of what we see. And every time we start to see things negatively, stop and try to find God in that moment. And if you can't, call someone and say, I can't find God. I need you to help me. And maybe you'll get one of those phone calls too. (laughs) And you can help someone see God. Let us all be people who see and choose joy and hope and see how far we can spread that around the world. Amen.